I want to start um, with my introduction to process mining um, based yeah, on, an, on, a, on a story of data analytics or almost big data analytics of 150 years ago. We're sitting in the time of the big maritime fleet. All the uh, commerce is uh, being done through the through the sea, and people are actually buying a lot of goods and are demanding a lot of goods. And um, the fleet they cannot um, yeah um, transport them fast enough. And there was already some innovation uh, on the side of the ships. So there was skipper was uh, invented, which was um, more flexible and faster ship. But apart from that, the only thing that people could do at that time. Um, to increase speed was uh, to just yeah sail 24 hours a day, take less breaks for the crew, and so on and so forth. Now, that was until Matthew Maori came. So he he's a special um, guy who who had yeah he was known to be quite opinionated. Also, he had ideas about things how sh things should work differently, and he was a as a captain uh, in the U.S. Navy. At some point in time, it is said that he actually broke his leg and then he started to, well, uh, sit because he was sitting all the time. He started to write letters to all to his bosses and about, you know, how things should work differently and why um, yeah, things should be done in a different way. And people didn't like that so much. So almost as a kind of punishment, they actually promoted him away um, to take charge of the U.S. Naval Observatory. So there he was working. Um, after that incident and a part of that um, observatory, there was an archive which was holding all the logbooks that were yeah, collected and written um, by the captains um, on the ships. So here you see an example of how such a logbook looked like. Um, the position was recorded, the time, also aspects like yeah, the wind and temperature and so on and so forth. Now, these logbooks, they were collected in the archive, but nobody was doing anything with it. And people had already thought about uh, to even throw them away. Maui was the first one who saw the potential of this kind of data. And he collected a team of people uh, and together they analyzed the logbooks of many different trips over a couple of years. And based on this analysis and uh, the information they extracted out of this analysis, they created maps. And this is how they, these maps looked like, uh, which were called sailing directions. So these maps showed um, the, the maps of the sea, but along with winds and currents, which enabled the captains uh, to find the ideal route for their trip. Uh, one of the first captains who used that was Captain Wright, who on a trip from Baltimore to Rio de Janeiro came back one month earlier than expected. So you can imagine the impact that this has had on, on the whole industry. And already five years later, everyone was using it. Um, also, not just the U.S. Uh, fleet, but globally. And globally, it was yeah, bringing in around $10 million per year in extra revenue because of the increased speed and you can that was 150 years ago you can imagine how much money there would be today now i i really like this the story because there is a lot of similarity in the maori story and and process mining because in process mining we also look at log data um, these data are collected by it systems um, that are recorded during uh, the operational processes are executed but often these log data are the first time evaluated in a structured way uh, when we analyze them with process mining and before nobody really looks at them um, and does anything with them. But of course, in contrast to Maori, we are not looking at uh, logbooks that are written on, on a ship by a captain, but of course, we are looking at um, data that are collected in a transaction system in IT systems such as ERP systems, workflow systems, IT service management systems, CRM system, and so on and so forth. So all these uh, IT systems uh, produce these kind of data that we can analyze with process mining. And later on, we will look into in more detail what kind of requirements uh, do we have towards the data, and you will learn how to how it works. Um, and of course. We are not creating maps here, not sailing directions, but we are creating process maps that show us how these processes have been really been performed, how these processes were 
running and where the bottlenecks are. And um, this gives us um, information about how to improve these processes. Okay, so this is um, what process mining is, but um, why do we need it? Um, what, what's the motivation behind using process mining? And here, a good way to look at it is if you think about the way that ideal processes or documented processes are specified. So often they're relatively simple and structured. So if you ask someone how they do their work, then they typically say, well, we do first this, then this, and it's a relatively structured. If, however, you look at the real processes, um, how they are performed in reality, you will realize that the actual processes are much more complicated. There's rework, there's variation, processes differ and um, are just much more complicated and not the same as they're typically documented or as people think of them. So now if that is true and there's this discrepancy between the ideal process and the, the actual process, we have to think about now what's the use of all these modeled these process models that we are creating if they are not reflecting reality. Organizations spend enormous amounts of money on documenting all their processes. Now, here's, a, here's an example that I brought from one of our projects where uh, the process manager had a problem with his process that he was responsible for and we were uh, analyzing that was process mining. While we were talking about these problems, he was bringing this picture here, which is the documented process uh, on their side as a huge uh, wallpaper. He put it on the table. And while he was doing that, he said, well, well, that's not actually our process. So people know that there's this discrepancy. He knew that the actual process didn't look like the documented process. And so therefore, this is uh, the gap. Uh, it's, it's just there. And what this means is that, of course, are these documented processes um, valuable and they're useful, for example, as a reference or to instruct new employees, but they're completely useless to solve problems in the process. If something's going on and I have to solve this problem for operational decision management, these kind of um, situations, you, 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 they are just of no help at all. Now, if we revisit this picture with the ideal process and the actual process, then we have to realize the biggest problem here isn't even this discrepancy or this gap between the ideal and the actual process. The biggest process is that problem is that we usually don't have any idea about how the real process looks like in the first place. So all this um, lack of information then uh, does, yeah, that, that, leads to the fact that we're not even able to make the comparison and to say, well, should we adapt the documented process? Should we enforce the documented behavior on the real process? What does, you know, how, what's the impact of this? We often, we don't even know. And there are different reasons why this is so difficult to understand the actual process and to get a complete picture of it. Here is just some of the reasons that people regularly bring, bring up. One of them is subjectivity. So everyone has a subjective view on the process based on their role and um, yeah, their part in it. Um, the second one is that yeah, a process is almost never performed by just one person. It's always done by multiple people and often across different um, departments and sometimes even across different companies. So everyone usually knows very well the part that they're involved in, but they have very little uh, idea about what happens in the process upstream or, or downstream. And another aspect is changes um, that yeah, may happen on a structured basis or, um, yeah, so the process may just change. Often process changes while uh, you will be analyzing it. Um, but also there are talk changes. Some customers need to be dealt with specifically and you need to make exceptions and so on and so forth. So all these factors contribute to the fact that there's very poor visibility and um, nobody really has an overview about how the processes are really running. Now, what does this mean for our problem solving and for our decision management? And um, yeah, so if something comes up and we have to make a decision about how to solve it in our operational process that we are responsible for, the only thing that we are left with is that uh, we have to rely on intuition, on intuition 
based on our experience, but we don't have objective information that we can base our decisions on. So in a way, we are like the captains that were, you know, um, that were on the sea before Maori sailing directions were available. They were limited to their own experience based on their own sailing experience. And they had to rely on their own intuition and they did not have access to more objective information. Now, if we talk about intuition, I think one thing um, to recognize is that often our int intuition is, is correct and we have the, well, the right intuition, the right hunch. And often that's because of this experience that we may have. So, for example, I see people who are working for 30 or 40 years in the same process. They know this process in and out and uh, they may know very well what the problems are and what should be changed. Still, what I can see in, in, in these situations is often they're not able to prove that they are right or to put their finger on it and to show it to someone else to basically make their point and to say, well, we should change something about this. And at the same time, we can also be wrong. Our intuition is not always correct. And um, yeah, although we have derived this from experience, we may just... Um, be wrong about it. There's an example, a nice example to illustrate this point, and I want to uh, I want to show that to you. So this is a story that I took from This American Life. It's an American radio show, and it's uh, animated an animated story about Robert and Tema, um, who basically experienced the same situation in two quite different ways. So let me first tell you the story from Robert's perspective. Now Robert tells it like this. He says. It's a beautiful day. They're walking down the Fifth Avenue. The Central Park is to the right. And then on the, on the left side, they see, well, they see Jackie Onassis, President Kennedy's wife. Well, it's some time ago, right? And she starts waving. And they just can't believe what, what they see, that she's waving at them, it, it seems to them. And um, yeah, very shyly, his, his uh, wife, Tamer, starts waving back and still can't believe it. Now, Jackie waves even more and Tema waves even more back and well, maybe you see it already coming. She was not actually waving to them, but uh, just um, calling a cab. Well, but that's not that's not the actual story. So the, the story is how Tema remembers the same situation here. And there are three main differences. The first one is that she says there were actually people a group of people who observed all this scenario. So it was particularly embarrassing for her. Uh, the second difference is um, yeah, a big one because it's a different place. It's not Fifth Avenue, but it's Madison Avenue. So that's quite, quite a big difference. But the third difference is the biggest because, well, Robert wasn't there. Robert was really not there at all. It's something that happened to her. Um, she told it to him. And over the years, um, he somehow transformed himself into the story. And then some years later, they find themselves at the dinner table. And he talks about the story as if he was present. And on the way home, she says, well, Robert, but you weren't there. But she says, well, I remember it so clearly. So as you can see, I don't know whether you know, you know this and you have similar experience, but sometimes you just don't know maybe you have dreamt something or, you know, memories change over time and memories are not particularly reliable. So I think that's a nice example to illustrate this. And it's one of the challenges that we have to deal with if we have to bring, make processes visible or document processes based on manual workshops and interviews. We have to deal with the subjectivity of all the participants and we have to deal with um, unreliable memory, which may be biased um, towards what happened just yesterday, for example. Now, another consequence that I sometimes see is that um, sometimes nothing happens at all. So that can also be a consequence. For example, in a copy manufacturer uh, here in the Netherlands that um, we, we worked with, they had the problem of their product data management system uh, or their yeah, product data management processes, they were broken. Everyone knew they, they weren't working very well and they wanted to, yeah, they wanted to change something about the processes and the systems, but they couldn't agree on what the problem was, what was the root cause of these problems. So 
in the end, nothing happened at all. And every five years, the same topic came up, but nobody did anything about it. So inaction can also be a consequence of these problems of subjectivity and um, yeah, bias. Now with process mining, of course, we are tackling exactly this very part of making the processes visible in the first place. So we provide a very accurate picture of the actual process, and this can then be the basis to either make changes to the documented process, to either enforce the, the, the real process if it's not um, being performed the way it should, but sometimes also you're, you're able to just live with certain differences, but you're able to really assess the real situation and to make decisions based on objective information and not just based on your intuition. Okay, so how does it work? Let's look at uh, how process mining works. And actually, I will I will tell you a little secret here. There's actually one way you can look at process mining and you understand it in a very simple way, but you understand really the essence of it, which is that with process mining, we are basically using like process-oriented meta model to look at the data from a process perspective. And to explain that to you, let's first look at another at another meta model, um, a meta model from data mining. So those of you, some of you uh, may know about data mining. So classification techniques are one type of algorithms that exist in data mining. And um, yeah, you can use that to learn and discover rules um, um, for uh, certain aspects. So here, for example, you see the meta model is in such that we have uh, example uh, data. So these are every row is one instance, one instance example, and every instance has certain attributes. Now these are learning instances that we can, that the data mining algorithm can use. And um, what we have to determine is what we want to learn. What is the rule that we want to um, yeah, discover about. And in this way, we are choosing the classification targets. So sh what should be classified? In this case, it's about whether um, the product has been bought or not. So do people buy the, the product or not? Um, and based on that, the data miner algorithm then automatically produces a decision tree, which is here shown on the right, um, which then um, we can read off some rules, like for example, uh, male customers that um, yeah that earn a lot they are buying our product so this is kind of a typical data mining um, problem and solution through this decision tree analysis now with process mining we have a slightly different meta model because we are looking at processes because we are looking at the data from a process perspective so what you will see here is that every row every line is not a complete example or a complete instance. It's just one event. It's one activity that were perf was performed in the process. But to look at a, at a complete process instance, we have to look at several lines because the process consists of multiple steps. So for that reason, one of the three minimum requirements that we need uh, for process mining is a case ID. We need a case ID or a process instance identifier. So as you see here in this example, there's this highlighted um, case in the middle, which is case 9705. So these are four events or four activities that were performed all for the same case. Um, in this case, we are looking at a customer service process. So this could be a service request number, for example, or maybe a, a customer customer ID. Um, so we use the, the case ID to group those events that belong to the same case. Um, now, the second requirement that we have is that we need to know which activity was performed, uh, which, what was the process step that was performed. So here in the highlighted example, you see the first activity was uh, registered. So the, yeah, the, the service request was registered and the last step was completed. And in between, a number of steps uh, were, uh, were performed. And the third minimum requirement is that we need to have at least one timestamp. And even if we're just uh, interested in understanding the process flow, we still need the timestamp because we have to establish the order of events for each of the cases um, to see what was the sequence of activities that was performed. 
Okay, so then there are a number of additional attributes, um, and often we have a lot of additional attributes that are important for the analysis that provide context information, additional information about the process. We can use it for analysis and for filtering, but as the basic process mining requirement, um, there are only these three, so it's very simple. If you look at your own data, you have to think about what's my case ID, um, what's my activity, and, and what's my timestamp. So you're looking for timestamps for the relevant activities in your own IT system. Now, having this, um, this um, process-oriented model in mind, if we look at a simple example here to illustrate how process mining then works. Um, so here you have a number of cases for which different activities are performed over time. So each of these steps is then recorded in the IT system. So this could be for example, a database in your ERP system, and each of these steps is stored in uh, in those tables. Now, that's the starting point for process mining. So we take those raw transactional data out of the IT system, um, and then as the first step, we are extracting uh, the different cases out of it to re-establish those activity sequence for each instance. So here you see for case number one, so for example, say this is, um, a sales process. This is uh, for the first customer. We follow the steps that the customer orders the product, then um, the product is paid, and then we deliver the product and so on and so forth. Now, if we look at the second customer, um, the process is similar, but it's not exactly the same. So activity B and C have been performed um, just the other way around. And that could be, for example, maybe that's a customer um, yeah, a, a good customer of ours who we know already and who, who we know will pay. So we can already deliver the product before we receive the payment. And a third um, example here is um, there you see a difference in that there's a repetition of activity D. So um, perhaps in this situation, we had to send out two, two times uh, a new offer. So these are the kind of variations that you will see in your process. And Process mining extracts all those cases and all those variants, but we then go one step further because we want to get an overview about the complete process to understand how this process is really performed. So if we would do that just based on the first case, then we would see a very simple and very sequ sequential process like it's shown here. But as soon as we take the second variant um, into this, then we see this variation also reflected in the process map. And with the third case, we see this loop uh, being added to enable the model to reflect the repetition of activity D. So with process mining, we take the raw transactional data on the left side and we turn it into visual graphical process maps that show the real um, process, how it was performed. So here you see an example of transactional data, and here you see the kind of models that we can produce with process mining based on those data alone. So this is a general introduction into how it works, but as a next step, I want to show you a demo based on a, a, based on a real example so that you can really get a good understanding of how process mining works and what it really means. So, um, so let me bring up first the example that we are looking at here. Um, so this is the example file that I'm analyzing with the process mining in a minute. Um, and we can also find back those minimum requirements that we were talking about before. In this case, we are looking at a purchasing process example extracted from, for example, an SAP system. And we see there are a number of steps here performed in this process. So that's one of the requirements that we have. The second requirement that we have is the case ID. So here we see a number um, and we see several um, events related to the same case. So that could be, for example, a purchase order number that is used here to group those events in the right way. And in this case, we also see um, a start and a complete timestamp. So we don't have just one timestamp, but even two, indicating each of them the start and the completion of this specific activity. If that's the case, um, that's even better, because in this case, we can distinguish the active time that someone is really spending within a certain activity and um, yeah, waiting times, idle times that are spent in the process where nobody is doing anything. So it's not always present 
but if it's available, that's um, that's very good. Now, then there can be additional data attributes. In this case, we just have two, one about the person who was doing um, the process step and then we, about the roles, about the function that they have in this process. Okay, so now imagine you're the, the process manager of this and you're responsible for this purchasing process and people actually complain to you and they say, well, uh, it takes very long and you have, you know, internal, you have agreements within your company how long this process should take. And you're wondering, are these exceptions? Are these just some people, um, you know, shouting very, very loudly? Or is this really a systemic problem? Is it a problem in my process? So what you're doing now is you're, um, analyzing um, your process based on those data that we just looked at. And here in Disco, we are importing the data set that we just looked at in Excel. And now as a first step, I have to make a mapping precisely for these three minimum requirements that we were discussing before. So um, which we need to take this process oriented perspective on those transactional data. So the first one is the case ID. We have configured that here. This is our activity. So we configure this as our activity. Um, the timestamps have been automatically detected. We have the resource here, and this is just one additional attribute. So we could have more attributes like that. Now, before we actually import the data, it's, it's good to just pause for a moment and to think again about how would we normally understand and make a picture of our SS process. It's through interviews and workshops, starting from a blank sheet of paper and uh, putting subjective views of people together. And in the end, not knowing how realistic and how close to reality those pictures really are. Now, with process mining, we can take a different approach. We really base um, this analysis on the data from the IT system that are recorded over the time. And basically with the push of a button, we are extracting the process and creating an objective map just based on the data um, that shows us how the process is really running. So let me explain to you how you can read this process map. Um, the process starts here at the top, the little triangle, that's the start point of the process. And we can see that there are 608 cases in the data set. So all of those 608 cases, they start with the activity create purchase requisition. Now, afterwards, the process splits into two alternative paths. 374 times I'm going this way. And as a second activity, I'm analyzing and performing analyze purchase requisition. Uh, 234 times I'm going this way. So as you can see, the numbers, the thickness of the arcs, and also the coloring of the activities, all those highlight and um, yeah, emphasize the frequency and show me what are the most frequent um, process flows in my process. Now, if I look at this process map, I can see one thing immediately very clearly. There's a very dominant loop here, a, a feedback loop to activity amend request for quotation. So it's not a normal step in my process, but instead I'm actually changing the original request for quotation. And this happens a lot. If you look at, if you look at it, here are 608 cases in total and more than 500 times I'm going through this loop. So this is an enormous waste, an enormous uh, overhead that is occurring here in my process, which by realizing this and knowing that this is a problem now by analyzing these data, I can, as a, as, a, as a second step, I can now find out what is the root cause for this and prevent this from happening in the first place. So this is the kind of um, yeah, insights you can get with process mining, detecting these kind of reworks and variations um, to make the process more efficient. Now, looking at process mining and discovering process maps like we have just seen here, it's important to realize one thing. Um, and that is real processes are really complicated and they're often very complex and you can't look at every detail at once. So what's really important for process mining algorithms is to be able to deal with that and to have a way to, um, to let you yeah, choose the level of detail that you want to look at your process. And Disco does this in a very intuitive way. Here on the right side, you see two sliders 
um, named activities and path. So and I, I, let me show you this by first dragging the activity slider to the to the lowest point. So at the bottom, what we see is only the the, the activities that are performed in the most frequent process variants. So this is really the main flow of the process. And then I can gradually pull up the slider and more and more also less frequently performed activities are showing up. And then at 100%, I really see every activity that was ever performed in my process. Even this one here, which is the, the least frequent one, amend purchase requisition, only occurred 11 times. Well, now, one thing that you may wonder is that you're coming in here 11 times and then eight times you're going this way. So you, you may be wondering, where are the other three? Right. So that's exactly the same principle. At the moment, we are only looking at the most frequent process flows. Um, but once we pull the path slider up to the very top, now we really see 100% of all the paths and all the activities. And here you can also see where those three are going. This is this is the way, and this path was just hidden before, before because we were just looking at the the main process flows um, uh, before. Okay, so we have seen already how, based on just raw transactional data, by taking a process view on the data and then applying, um, letting our process mining algorithm run over it, we can extract an objective and factual map of how these processes are really going, which um, provides us now um, a with the possibility to make decisions based on objective information and to really understand how our process is executed. Now, there are two uh, more ways in DISCO to also look at the process from a process perspective, but on a slightly more detailed level. I want to quickly show that to you. Um, the second one is statistics. So um, in statistics, we're um, getting overview statistics about the process. For example, here um, we see that um, we have 608 cases, so 608 purchase orders. We have seen that before already in the process map. We also see that there are 9,000 and something uh, events. So this is a very small uh, data set. Uh, process mining and Disco can deal with millions of events, so um, that's a very small sample. Um, at the same time, we see, uh, for example, the time frame. So what's the time frame of the data set that we are looking at? We see the process snippet that we're analyzing starts in January 2011 and it ends in October 2011. So it's around uh, 10 months of data that we are analyzing here. And just to give one more example, the case duration, that's really the time from the very beginning of the process to the end. Um, and we can see that in most cases, so yeah, uh, it's finished within 16, 17 days. I have completed my process, but there are some that are really taking very long. So 70, 80 days and more. So it seems like those people complaining that the process takes long. It's not just a couple of outsiders and examples, but it's really, it seems to be a bigger problem. So again, as a process analyst or a process owner, that's very interesting information for me, and I can use that um, to, to to improve the process. And in the next step, in a minute, we will I will show you how we can look into this problem specifically in more detail. But before we do that, let's look at the process on one more level, uh, one level deeper, and this is the cases view where we really see every case. So a list of the 608 cases here, every case, every purchase order with the detailed history is shown and we can see all the people who were involved, the, the timestamp information, all the additional attributes, everything that we have imported from our uh, from our original data is here and provides concept, context information. And that's something that's very important if you want to, to follow up and take action on some of the insights and uh, problems that you found. You need to get down to this um, detailed example level to look things up in the original system and to take action, to talk to the people who were involved, and so on and so forth. Now, one thing that's also very useful uh, in practice is that here you also have a list of variants. And a variant is a specific sequence of activities from the beginning to the very end of the process. So one path through the whole process. And of course, several cases can follow the same path. So here you have them sorted based on their frequency. And for example, the most frequent variant is followed by 88 cases. And um, you can see that that makes up about 
15% of the whole data set. And now you have here a list of those 88 cases. They all have the same sequence of activities, but of course, um, they occur at different times, performed by different people, and so on and so forth. Now, by looking at the just the top five or top, um, yeah, top 10 variants, you often get already a very good understanding about the 80% or 90% of your most frequent process flows, um, and, and that helps um, to see, yeah, what the mainstream behavior of your process is. So if we look at our example here, actually, we can see something else that is uh, a bit strange because the third most frequent variant covering about 10% of uh, all of our cases, they're stopped after analyzed purchase requisition. So after the request is analyzed, it is stopped and well, we can ask ourselves why that happens so often. Perhaps people don't know what they can what they can buy. Maybe we have to update the purchasing guidelines. So that's something we can look into also as a follow up uh, step to this um, to this analysis. And if we look at the process map, we can see that we can connect this to to show you how we can read the map. So here you see this again. So after analyzed purchase requisition, you see this dashed line, which is leading to the end. So here, this is a start point of the process. This is one of the endpoints of the process. And if we scroll down, we can see that there are actually three different endpoints here, one regular one and two uh, premature endings where the process is stopped before it should be. Now, so these are all views um, that are generated just by looking at the data from a process perspective uh, in an automated way. But the way we work with the process mining tool is in, a, in an interactive way um, by answering questions and by looking more into detail into things that we found out by, by, these, um, uh, by, by our initial analysis. And to illustrate to you how that works, let's look at the statistics um, example that we had here of the case duration. So these very long running cases of 80 and 90 days or more, um, how we can yeah, look into this in more detail. And for that, uh, we are adding a performance filter and the performance filter, choose that from the list of filters. And so we are looking at the case duration and we're, for the moment, let's say we are only focusing on those very long running cases, like for example here, 70 days, um, let's say everything that takes 70 days and more, and only those very long running cases is what we are focusing on in the moment. And we see this is covering about 15% of, yeah, of the whole data set. So it's, it's quite a lot. Um, so once we apply this filter, what happens now is that we see in the lower left corner, um, there's an indication that we are looking at these 15%. Uh, so we know it's not the full data set. And actually, it's the 92 very slow, very long running cases that are now used to form the basis of this process map. And as you can see, this uh, loop that we have seen before is now even more dominant than before. On average, I'm going through this loop now around three times, um, which is three three times as, as high as before. So this is certainly one thing that contributes to those very long delays. But well, actually, now that I'm focused on the on the throughput times, I'm much more not so much interested in the frequency of those process flows. What I really want to see is the performance information. So I'm switching from the frequency view to the performance view here in the uh, lower right, and then. The default view, you get um, a total duration, which is really the sum of all the delays, which is very useful to do uh, to find out what the high impact areas are for very frequently uh, performed parts of the process. Also, small changes can have a big impact. So that's very useful. But for the moment, let's look at the average duration. And what we see here is that well, not only are we going through this loop, completely in a completely unnecessary way, but it also takes on average more than 14 days to actually get back into the normal process. And we can see that also from other parts of the process, we have these kind of delays. And this is a clear bottleneck that we have here that we should address. And maybe we need to um, assign more people to this to this function in the process to, to speed things up and improve this problem. Now, once we have discovered such a bottleneck uh, or yeah, any analysis result, um, 
we often want to share this information with our colleagues or with the people working in the process because this is just the starting point to actually um, yeah, start the actual process improvement and to discuss what are the root causes and what are possible ways to solve this. So one way that's very helpful also to communicating these kind of results is the animation. So I will show you this quickly here. Um, and let me zoom in a little bit. So the animation is really a replay of the actual process. Um, every yellow dot, I'm moving forward in the timeline a little bit, every yellow dot is one case. So it's one purchase order that has been performed. Um, and yeah, the, so instead of, it's not a simulation, but it's really a, a replay of the actual data in my process map. And over time, I can then see where in the process in which areas um, yeah, bottlenecks emerge, where we get a lot of queuing of cases and where things take long and where they are faster. So this is something that is a very um, yeah, direct way of communicating um, my process analysis results and gives me a way to share this information with the stakeholders in the process. And it's a very intuitive um, and accessible way. So you don't need to be a process expert in the sense that, um, yeah, these kind of process modeling languages like BPMN or often people working in operational processes, they're not, they don't even know that BPMN exists. So this is a very intuitive process notation that allows them to, to really uh, follow and understand their process um, as it is really performed. Um, so as you can see, process mining is really very suitable to uh, be used also in interactive workshops and um, yeah, in interactive discussions. So it's it's not at all, uh, sometimes people think like it's a push of a button operation where you just input data and out comes uh, everything, uh, it's ready. You need the human judgment, you need the domain knowledge to make the right interpretations of what you are seeing and what the good ways are to solve it. But um, yeah, instead of spending a lot of time to just establish um, the SS process and to document what the SS process is, you can start right away with um, root cause analysis, with discovering, uh, discussing alternatives. And this is what the value brings for the organizations um, uh, when you're talking about a process improvement. Now, um, I want to show you two more things to illustrate a little bit the spectrum um, that we that we have with with process mining analysis. And for that, let me go back to the remove this filter again, and I'm going back to the complete data set and also the frequency view. So, as you can see, we are now back to the complete data set with the 608 cases, um, and we are looking at the end of the process here. So, what you can see is that. The thick line clearly shows the most dominant path that is taken by most of the of the cases through this process. And then there's an invoice created, and in the end, the invoice is paid. But actually, this one activity, release supplier's invoice, it's also a mandatory activity. It really uh, has to be there, um, and um, that's to prevent fraud, so people should really uh, perform this activity. But what we can see here from this process mining analysis is that actually there are 10 cases that are bypassing that particular step. Um, and well, this is in this case, it's a compliance issue. So um, we are deviating from the, from the prescribed process flow. And yeah, first of all, we can see that that is happening. Perhaps we didn't even know that was possible in, in our system. We clearly see here that this is happening. We see how often it's happening, uh, 10 times. So it's for 600 cases, it's, it's quite a lot actually. And now as a next step really to take action and to follow up with this, uh, I want to know which 10 cases are following this path. Now, so to do this, I can simply click on this path and then I say, filter this path, which means give me all cases um, that are traveling along this particular route in the process. And once I do that, I get another filter, which is in this case pre-configured. That's a, yeah, a shortcut from the process map. I could also manually um, add that. And just applying this filter brings me to the data set 
of these 10 cases. But now the process map is not very interesting for me because in this case, I really want to see the list of those 10 cases and I want to talk to the people who are involved um, who did that so I can ask them. Maybe there was a specific reason for them to skip this particular step. And if not, it gives me an opportunity to give them targeted training to prevent this um, compliance problem from in the future. Now, the last thing I want to show is uh, has to do with the um, yeah the diff the process view that we can take um, on the on the process and how we can do that um, based on our meta model also in different ways. So I'm going back to the import screen. Um, let's say we have analyzed the activities in our process, have understood everything in detail, and now we actually want to understand more the organizational flow in the process. So we want to see how the process flows through the different functions in um, yeah, in this purchasing process. And by reconfiguring the role as our activity here, we can import the data and based on the same data set, we get an alternative view on this process, which shows us how the handover of our cases occurs between different functions in my organization. You can see ping pong effects like here where uh, this is handed back to the original requester. Uh, and of course, we can do a performance analysis. So we see where inefficiencies emerge at the boundaries um, of, of at the organizational boundaries in our organization. OK, so this um, um, gives an overview about the things you can do with Postman. There are many more uh, things that I could show, um, but we can look at it later on um, based on your questions or as a follow up to this webinar. So for now, I'm going back to the to the presentation and to conclude the presentation where um, well first of all um, there there are two different uh, types of reactions that I typically get if people are seeing their own process for the first time made visible through process mining techniques and the first type of reaction is uh, I knew it so those are the people who had the right intuition who had the right hunch uh, if you want to say it um, about what's wrong or what they thought how the process was going. So, um, but although they knew it before, now they have a chance to actually put their finger on it and to put it on the table, uh, to point to it in an objective way because it's based and measured based on the actual data from the IT systems. And then it helps them to make their case and to actually make their voices heard. Now, the second type of reaction is, well, impossible. <laughs> Our system doesn't even allow for that. I, I hear that all the time. So you always find things that are surprising that you didn't think were even possible in the process. And then, um, well, you look it up, you track down um, to the individual cases, you look them up in the original system, and then you, you see, well, in fact, it's true. And then there is some explanation about what was going on. So there are, there are things that you may know which can be confirmed and made um, fact-based and um, measure measurable and there there are usually almost always also things that will surprise you because processes are so complex today that nobody really has an overview about them okay so to conclude this presentation I want to show I want to talk quickly about three different case studies also to give you an idea about the different types of analysis that can be done and the different types of applications that are possible. And the first one is um, an IT service management process um, where the ETL change management process was analyzed. And that was something that we did at ANA airports together with our um, partner in, in, in uh, Portugal, partners process sphere. And um, so we looked at their change management process where they had some, some problems with. And I used this case also as a as a way to um, yeah describe to you how a typical process mining project typically um, is performed. So there are four different phases that you will go through. Um, and the first phase is the scoping phase where you're determining what's the goal of the analysis, what are the questions that you have about the process, and also what's the process scope, where does the process start, where does it end. Um, and this, that's the stage where you're also thinking about, well, what's my case ID, what are the relevant activities that I would like to see. Um, and you will see what IT systems are involved. Is this process 
performed with the help of one IT system? Does it is it performed across multiple IT systems? Um, so in the case of the um, change management process at Anna Airport, uh, we were looking at the, the um, their process because they had problems with the backlog. So they wanted to find ways of getting rid of the backlog and to find ways of uh, working with the same amount of people in a more efficient way to not get into these uh, backlog problems again um, after uh, the process improvement. So that was the goal this analysis was centered around. And the second stage then is the data extraction. And for that, you're working together with the IT uh, department and um, yeah, your uh, system administrators are helping you to extract the right data and, and um, you're telling them the kind of data that you need. So in our case, um, it, at Anna Airports, it was quite easy because the IT service management system that they had was able to export directly um, the, the data and the case ID was a ticket number which was readily available. And um, yeah, we had to make uh, a translation of the status codes or uh, action codes uh, that were in the system to some activity name that made sense to us. But apart from that, uh, we didn't have to do much data processing. So we could use those data then to do the actual data analysis, the process analysis. And um, in this case, we did such an interactive workshop um, there and we did this in one day. So there was one day workshop with the CIO, the process manager and the system manager um, where we actually looked at this change management process in different ways uh, based on different change categories. And we used animation, but also other analysis tools and uh, focused on things that we found um, to, yeah, to generate more than 15 process improvement proposals within at, at the end of this one day. And many of those proposals were also um, yeah, applicable to other ETL processes such as problem and incident management for them as well. So that shows how based on um, yeah, data and process mining, you can, you can very quickly and directly analyze a process and get to actionable results very quickly. Now, just three examples of the kind of results that we found through during the analysis is that one of the problems was that in the beginning, after the change request was registered, there was uh, yeah, there was too much time that was spent before the change request was classified. So it needed to be classified to be further processed downstream. But because people were not doing that fast enough, there was a lot of queuing and case, uh, requests were uh, held up there and that was delaying them and building up um, the whole cues in, in the process. A second problem that we found is that change orders went directly to implementation. And well, any one of you who's familiar with ETL knows that that's absolutely something that's not possible and that uh, may not happen because you always have to analyze first what the impact is of the change request on other parts of the system and the infrastructure um, landscape to prevent side effects that are not wanted. So. Well, luckily it turned out it was not a compliance issue because it was quite a lot of cases that this happened, but in fact, they were misusing the system to re-document um, um, change configuration items. And um, well, while it was not a compliance issue anymore, it was still a problem because all their system and the dashboards and the KPIs were based on the assumption that the, the system was used correctly. And those uh, this misuse was not uh, known to management and it was actually influencing those figures. So they were steering their processes on, on, on a completely wrong basis. Now, the last uh, one I want to show here is that there was also a delay after the implementation. So this was also further delaying the process. And the second example is um, well, a service refund process of an electronics manufacturer. And this is exactly the picture you have seen earlier. And well, before I didn't talk about um, how this picture, what it means and how it can be read, and I won't go into e detail here either, but what you can see is that there are these kind of um, swim lanes, uh, those bluish bars uh, that are going horizontally. And what they mean is that each of those swim lanes is one unit or one entity that is participating in the process. So there are a lot of different entities here involved in this refund process. And 
in fact, it's not only different departments within the organization, but it's also external companies. So this was a service process, a customer service process, where imagine, for example, um, you're a customer, you have bought an MP3 player and it's broken. You have sent it to repair and you get it back from the repair and it's still broken. So that's the kind of process you get into. Someone who has been already disappointed by the company and um, is now going into this refund process. So it's a very critical customer facing, very important process for the electronics manufacturer. And they were going into this analysis because they got serious complaints, very unhappy customers. And they also didn't know how serious it was because they had completely no transparency about what was going on. So um, there were different parties involved outside of the company, which were, for example, the call center. So customers could call in at a call center. So that was outsourced. Um, yeah, customers could bring in, hand in their product where they bought it to start this process. So that could be a dealer like, I don't know, Best Buy or um, Media Mark, or there were all these kinds of local brands that were People buy their products and hand them in for repair. Um, then there were the logistics companies who were picking up the product at the customer's uh, home and bring them to the repair shops. And there are all the repair shops, which are all, again, independent or, uh, companies. So all of these companies work together to, to deliver this, the repair service to the, to the customer, but the electron, customer electronic um, uh, yeah, consumer electronics company is the one responsible and really interested in this process. So um, what we did is we analyzed the data for them and showed them um, the inefficiencies and problems that they had across this outsource and multi-party uh, process. And just to show you some of the examples that we got from this analysis is um, here's a very simplified view on the start of the process, uh, which we compared based on where the process was started. So was it started by the customer calling in at the call center or was it started by the customer uh, himself or herself by starting this process at the internet? So um, the process maps are simplified here and just show the, the mainstreams of the process, but you can clearly see that there's one problem in the, in the process if it started uh, through the internet is that there is missing documents requested. This activity, is happening a lot and sometimes more than once. And it means that really some one of the service um, employees has to get in touch with the customer and request additional information. So this is something that's uh, very expensive, time consuming for the company, but it's also delaying the process further for, for, the, for the customer. Uh, with the call center um, started cases, it wasn't that much of a problem. So uh, actually what they did is that they fixed um, the forms that they had to start this process on their internet website. And uh, so they made certain forms more, more readable. They made certain forms and entities um, mandatory. So for example, you have to hand in um, the receipt of the product once you bought it, so a scan of this. And well, so that helped a lot to prevent these kind of additional um, steps to, to ask for this additional documents. And another thing that we found out is that different logistics companies were performing very differently. So here's one of them um, that uh, pointed out, which was taking well, 16 days, uh, delaying the process 16 days on average. And it was not a very high volume, um, uh, not the most high volume stream was going through it, but they had a strategy that they were uh, only passing on the pallet if it was full. So they were collecting the products and only send it on to the repair shop afterwards. Now, if you were the unlucky customer who was the first in an empty pallet, then that was really, uh, you were unlucky and you had to wait a long time until your product was passed on. So that was something they could fix just by understanding that this problem existed um, in, their, in their process chain. So there are, um, um, some more compliance issues that we found when customer got his money back twice. Um, you had to hand in the product to get the refund. Uh, so twice uh, that didn't happen. And a couple of times an important approval step was skipped. Um, now the last um, case study is also a, a nice example because it's, it's a problem that's very common in, in many processes, in many organizations. And 
this is about a purchase to pay process or purchasing process at a Dutch chemical company, Axel Nobel, um, and was performed by Capremini um, and was performed using our process mining tool, Disco, uh, the process mining analysis. Now, the problem that they had is that um, they had 16 different local branches, so different countries, where they had um, purchasing processes established, and they were had been moving all of those onto one system. So all of them were now using SAP before they were using different systems. But, well, because this change of moving through this one new system was so big, um, they didn't move uh, yeah, didn't require all those 16 countries to um, move to the same process at the same time. So everyone was basically working as before in their old process, but on this on, on one system now. So the next step and challenge for them was now how to harmonize those local uh, different versions of the purchasing process that they had in, in, in basically 16 different versions now and to understand what was going on, to find out, well, what's the best practice, which ones should we take as the blueprint, which ones should we take as the template for those other ones, and how can we harmonize them in the best possible way. So rather than going to all these 16 countries and doing brown paper sessions and discovery workshops, which would have taken months of time, um, many months, so they were doing this process mining analysis based on the SAP data that they had readily available, and then they could follow up based on the results they got to clarify, to um, have additional meetings and to understand in more detail what was going on and that was a big success and uh, it's a very nice way to show how process mining can uh, be employed um, to yeah, harmonize processes um, that are now uh, existing in many different versions. Well, that's what I wanted to um, show you here today. We have seen what process mining is, how it works. We have looked at, the, at an example uh, in the demo, and we have looked at several application areas here. Now, you are coming from many different backgrounds, and as I promised, um, you, yeah, we, we want to give you the possibility to try this for yourself and to apply one of your own processes. Um, so, what you can do to get uh, to do this is that um, you you just go to our website flexicon.com/disco, uh, where you can download the demo version of. Um, yeah, our Disco software. And um, once you have installed it, you will see that if you import one of your own data sets, that this demo version only imports the first 100 events. Um, so that's enough to, tr to play around and to test the concept to also see whether the format and the kind of data that you have are all right. But it doesn't really allow you any more detailed analysis of your own data. And we really want you to try this for yourself on one of your own data sets. So what we want to do is to give you an extended license where you have without data import limit, you can analyze uh, one of your processes. And uh, to get this license, you just drop me a quick email. So you find my email address on the website. It's um, a -N -N -E for Anna at flexicom.com. And then you will get this extended license um, on a short notice. Uh, so I'm really curious also um, how this works out for you. Process mining is a generic technology, very applicable in, in many different areas. And yeah, so the, the benefits and the kind of questions that you have about the process really are different depending on whether you're an auditor, whether you're a process manager, and whether you're analyzing a purchasing process or, for example, a customer service process. But um, yeah, so if you have questions about this, you, you're thinking right now how this applies to your own background, um, feel free to ask questions and we will take the time to answer all of them.